Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast loves, love endures forever and his faithfulness to all the generations. This is the word of the Lord. So let's stand and sing our next hymn. Bring to the Lord a glad new song. The second reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ, will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are all being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Wow, thank you very much. Romans is very difficult to read from. Romans 8 is especially difficult to read from. So I said to Paul, I'm going to have to rehearse. I don't know whether you rehearsed, but you've read it beautifully. So thank you so much. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you for this day as we celebrate this 126th birthday. It's a celebration of your faithfulness and your goodness to this, your church. But it's not just about us here, it's about the way that we serve you in this world, and particularly here in Hong Kong. So may this celebration not just be for us uh, to have a good time, but an opportunity to hear your voice and to hear that call to serve, to follow, to give up everything to follow. So, Lord, speak to us now, we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Well, if you can't pull out all the stops for a birthday, when can you pull out all the stops, though? I think we've pulled out all the stops. I don't think Gary's got any stops left on his organ to pull out, so well done. Uh, And I love the, I mean, it's not really that new, but the words to the old Jerusalem tune. I don't like the old words to the Jerusalem tune, but I love the tune. Very British, very English. Uh, When Gary said, perhaps we could have Elgar's pomp and circumstance to end with, I thought that might be pushing it a bit too far. Too English, too British. So we'll save that for another occasion. But it's so good to see you all and to be worshipping together. People from all over the world, we come together into this international church and we celebrate this 126th birthday. Uh, So happy birthday, Methodist International Church. You're looking quite well, I have to say. You're looking quite well. It's all a bit different from when it began, our Hairstyles are a bit different, perhaps, for some of us. <laughs> We're not wearing any hats anymore. Can't see any hats out there. Uh, there's no military uniform. We were a garrison church in the early days. And uh, we've got film clippage of uh, clips of uh, batoons, or whatever we call them in the British Army, marching into church. Uh, but I don't see any military uniform here today. So we're very different, of course. And I'm not wearing a 19th century frock coat either. It would have been very hot in those days here. Um, We're very different, of course, over that period of time. This church has evolved and developed and grown. And this whole new building reminds us today that God is always doing a new thing. Always doing a new thing for his church, but always doing a new thing in your life and my life. So we are different, yes, but we look pretty handsome, I have to say. We're a handsome group of people, so congratulations on this birthday. Today, of course, we are celebrating not the beginning of the church community, but the opening of the church building on this site 126 years ago tomorrow, which would have been Pentecost Sunday all those years ago. It was torrential rain as they gathered to open the church, which seated about 300 people. But the beginnings of the church go back much, much further, maybe even to 180 years ago, when a group of British soldiers, uh, Barrington Stanley, met together. They held a Wesleyan class meeting. <clears throat> they were led by a man called Roland Rees. And uh, our first kind of evidence for this church is in a letter that was sent by Roland Rees to the British Methodist Conference meeting. And uh, Roland Rees said to the British Methodist Church, please send us missionaries uh, to help with the work here in Hong Kong. And um, at that stage, the British Methodist Church was stretched to capacity. The British Empire was sprawling. Our missionaries were sent all over the empire, and there were not enough to come to Hong Kong. So bad luck, Roland Rees. You just have to carry on doing your stuff. But the extraordinary part of the story, and one of them for me about our church is George Pearson. The first time I came to Hong Kong was an anniversary of George Pearson's, about seven or eight years ago, I'm terrible at dates, but about eight years ago. George Pearson was a farmer in Pickery, uh, which is a very remote sort of part of Yorkshire, very beautiful in England. And God could not have put his hand on someone in more of a remote place to come to Hong Kong. In Pickering, it's a beautiful little market town, agricultural, um, in North Yorkshire, very remote. And somehow, in that remote farm, plowing his fields, he heard God call him, go to China. It's an extraordinary story. And the church didn't call him, the Methodist church didn't send him, but he heard the call. 
And he packed up everything, he sold everything he had, and he bought a ticket on a boat, and he worked the entire voyage over to Hong Kong. And a voyage in those days took well over a hundred days. There was no Panama Canal, you had to go underneath Africa and up and around. At least a hundred days, if you were going directly. But I'm sure his boat stopped along the way. And he worked the entire voyage until he got here. And when he got here, he began this extraordinary work with Roland Rees and others to build this Wesleyan, as it was then called, society. Isn't it extraordinary that God should call that man in such a remote place? What did he know about China? Nothing except what other missionaries had told him as he listened to them. He gave it all up. And set out. I mean, I sometimes think I'm a marvellous man. You know, I, I went to Vietnam and I came here a long, long way from home. But it's not really that bad, is it? It's just a 12-hour flight now. And, uh, you know, I knew what I was coming to. I'd seen it before I set out. But there was a man. Gave up everything. And just set out. Trusting in God. And that's what God calls all of us to do. Now, on Tuesday, I returned from the UK. I spent 10 days visiting uh, family and friends. My family live in Nottingham, my friends in London. So in the second weekend, I was in London. And, uh, you know, typically Britain, the weather was uh, rain, uh, sunshine, hail. Uh, I don't think we got any snow. Uh, but it was everything, all in one day. Uh, very British. But on Sunday, I decided I would go to Wesley's Chapel on City Road in the city of London. Now, Wesley's Chapel is uh, slightly different from our own Wesley Chapel below. Uh, Wesley's Chapel in London was built on an old site which once had a foundry on it. And John Wesley preached in the foundry in 1739. And afterwards he managed to buy the site and build a church or a, a meeting place or a preaching house as he would have called it. And uh, and so Wesley's Chapel, it was very plain, it was a very simple Georgian building. Today, it's a bit grander. As the Wesleyans made their money, they put some of it into this chapel and made it rather grand. I went in on Sunday morning to Wesley's Chapel to worship. I looked around for a seat. Uh, I found a place on a hard wooden pew. Uh, 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 my aching back and other various parts of my anatomy already missed MIC and the beautiful soft purple chairs that we have in this church. Uh, the service was uh, dignified, uh, but rather formal and traditional. But I missed MIC again for its kind of dignity in its informality. You know, there's a, there's a dignity here too, but it's different. Uh, the organist played <laughs> at a speed which Mr. Wesley would not have approved of, I think. Uh, which I didn't approve of either. Uh, I'm always saying to Gary, faster, louder! <laughs> because I'm a great follower of Mr. Wesley and his instructions for singing. And I particularly like his point four of the seven points of Wesley's instructions for singing, which says, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep. But lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, no more ashamed of the being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Wow. There are six more points for singing if you care to read them. But this organist prayer played at a far too slow pace. It was like being at a funeral, sadly. And then the hymns were pretty much like that as well. But then we prayed. And I bowed my head with everybody else. And we prayed. But midway, as like many of you, I get a bit distracted in prayer, and I lifted up my head, and there before me, on the wall ahead of me, was a memorial plaque, and uh, the other bane of our life are music stands. It was covered by music stands. Music stands get everywhere, don't they? I've noticed this here in this church, too. They cover lots of things. They're put in places, just think out the way. And music stands were covering most of this memorial plaque. But as I looked at it, I could see the name, Charles Wenyon. And uh, I began to dredge my brain. I knew I knew this man. I thought he had something to do with Hong Kong. So as I 
dredged my brain, which takes a long time these days, I began to realize and remember who he was. He uh, was uh, a Wesleyan minister, he was a medical doctor, who had not only spent years in China setting up hospitals, but had also been the superintendent of the Wesleyan Mission Canton, or Guangzhou, and I said this morning I probably pronounced that wrong, but that's where it was, Canton. He was the superintendent of the area. And crucially for us, Wenyan wrote letters to the British government asking for land. To build a church. And it was because of him that we have this land to have this building on today. The land was granted by the Governor General on Christmas Day, 1892. Wenyan travelled a lot, he wrote a lot, he was always extremely busy, so he wasn't here for the opening of that church, and soon he left and went back to the UK, and he became minister at Wesley's Chapel in London. And there he was memorialized in the stone on the wall behind the organ and the music stands, almost forgotten. Almost by chance, some might say, that you saw that, Eden. You saw that memorial stone hidden away round the corner. If you'd chosen another seat, you wouldn't have seen it, and I wouldn't. But I felt more, it was something of God that led me at this moment to see this stone there. At the end of the service, I went and cleared away the music stands and took a picture. I was quite moved when I remembered him and thought about him and all that he'd done, all that he'd given up in in Britain to go all that way into China and all that he'd done using his medical skills to, to serve the sick and the needy and building, literally building hospitals and then serving the growing Wesleyan church in this area and writing to the government for this land that we now have this marvellous building on. As I stood before it, that stone, I felt really God. Actually, I felt a connection, again, with the British Methodist Church. You know, it's funny when you move away and come to Hong Kong, you're part of the Hong Kong Methodist Church, and you can feel a bit dislocated from your home church, a long way from the church that ordained you. But as I stood before that stone on that Sunday morning, I felt a connection again. Here was a man who'd left home and gone all the way to China, Hong Kong, and then gone home. And I felt a connection with the church. And I also felt what an enormous privilege he must have felt to have been sent out, as the privilege that I felt being sent out to. On anniversary Sundays, it's good to look back. It's good to remember the men and women of the past who have helped to shape the life of the church or society or the world. John Wesley went much further than just a church or an organization. He changed England and he changed some of the world too through his preaching and his influence. And sometimes as we look back and read about saints of the past, we can be encouraged or challenged by their experience of all that they went through, of all that they gave up to serve God. And we can ask ourselves, are we the same sort of people who are so willing to give up everything, to be confident in God, to trust everything to God, to surrender all to God, that God could really use us? I believe that God did great things in the past. But I'm a firm believer that God will do even greater things in the future. And that's what I'm trusting in. And that's what I'm hoping for. These men and women of the past and all that they endured to fulfill their calling in all that they sacrificed and all that they laid down. Well, they make me think. They make me question myself. Do I have the self-same courage they had to step out not knowing what the future might hold? Have I surrendered my all to God? I mean really surrendered. Would I go wherever he chooses to send me? Do I have a boldness about my ministry and my life and my calling and the vision that God has given me for his coming kingdom? Do you? Or am I 
far too wrapped up in myself, in my own needs and challenges and desires that I have little time or regard for God's coming kingdom or his call upon my life. God's good plan is unfolding day by day, year by year. And it's a plan for all eternity. And God longs that every one of us shares in that great plan, becomes part of that great work that he is undertaking. He needs us. He needs you. He needs me to commit and to follow. So how are you doing And how am I doing? So today we do indeed enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. We give thanks to him. We praise his holy name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Love never fails as we've been seeing. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So look back and be lost in wonder and awe and joy at God's awesome deeds through the ages. And let those deeds, those lives that shape this church help you in your present circumstances. Give you the courage and boldness and confidence in the God who is calling you and wants to achieve great things through you. At his inauguration as president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, on the 10th of May, 1994, it seems to all happen in May, uh, He used the words of a poet. Many people then attribute these words to him, but he'd actually taken words from a very famous poet, Marianne Williamson, and used them for his opening uh, inaugural address. And they are wonderful words that I occasionally turn to. And let me read them to you today. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant and gorgeous and talented and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. God did not call men and women to be shrinking violets, to hide their lights under bushels, to be afraid of the present or the future. He does not call us to that. So do not let the world press you down destroy you or your dreams or crush the vision that God has laid before you or upon your heart. Do not let the world tell you that you are worthless or that it'll never work. You'll never achieve anything. Don't set your sights too high. You might fail. These are all the wily words of the devil. And he only wants your demise and ultimately your destruction. So don't listen. Instead, Like the men and women of old, the saints of the past, put your hope in God, who in Christ is redeeming all things through the cross, and who has redeemed you. You are his, and he is yours. Nothing, as we heard in Romans 8, can separate us from God in Christ. If God did not even spare his own son, how much more will he give his love for us? Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Not hardship, not distress, not persecution, not famine, not nakedness, peril, or even the sword. No, nothing 
Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ. We are more than conquerors. The missionaries that went out in the 19th centuries believed in the call of God to go to all the world to proclaim a message of love and to take the gospel. They were bold, they were courageous, they trusted completely. You know, there was even a missionary society in England that called missionaries to go, and then each missionary had to make a coffin and put all their belongings in it before they'd set sail because they were never coming back. It was a one-way trip, and yet they went. If you look at the mission boards in the Methodist Church House in Britain, with the lists of missionaries sent out over the years, you'll see names and dates. Missionaries sent out one year, six months later, dead, from tropical disease or something else. And two months later, somebody else would go. Name after name after name. People sent. People heard the call and they went, trusting in God. It was awesome. It was amazing. But now it's our time. It's our generation. It's our opportunity to make a difference. It's our turn to hear the call of God for our lives, for your life. When the memorial stone appears with your name on it, what will it say? What will your epitaph be? What will people write about you? She was faithful. She did her best. She trusted in God. He never gave up. He was courageous. He was bold. He preached the gospel. He lived the gospel. You know, as I look out today, I think the words that I hear God say to us, I think are, well done, good and faithful people. You have been courageous in building this great new church. A reminder of God always making things new. You were courageous and bold in literally giving everything up. Your old building with all of its memories and feelings. It was old, it wasn't very big, but we knew joy there. We found love there. Our children were baptized. There were weddings and funerals. It was important to us. We gave it up. We gave up our money, very literally, emptied our bank accounts and some more to build this place. We lost some people along the way. We gave up a lot to get to where we are today, in our time and in our generation. And I believe God is going to bless us because of that. Because when we give up everything, that's when God can really use us. And that's what you did, church. And I believe that God, therefore, is really able to use us. We see that already. Praise God. You know, uh, I think it was four weeks ago, we launched the Diamond Appeal. You remember? We wanted 60 people to uh, donate $10,000 each uh, in time for this anniversary Sunday to raise $600,000. We have raised, drum roll please, $565,000. Yeah, we should applaud. Three more people today and we made it. <laughs> that is extraordinary. The generosity of you people to commit to this project, this mission, this work is extraordinary. And God is blessing and will bless us. And in time, I don't think I'll ever get a memorial stone in a church somewhere. Or maybe some of you will. But in time, people will look back on us and say they were the people that built this great church. Now we have a building. Now we have to build this great church community. 
And that's really what we want people to say about us. So praise God for his faithfulness, his goodness, and his mercy that has followed us all the days of our life. And we look forward to even greater things that God will do amongst us in the next few years and in all the years to come until Christ's kingdom fully comes amongst us. So, with me, lay it all down before God and take up the call to serve and to follow and to give yourself without regard that he might use you powerfully for his work. Amen. We're going to sing a song. Sing of the Lord's goodness. Let's stand and sing together. Please sit as we pray at the end of our service. So our hearts are full and glad today, O oh God, as we look back and remember all those men and women of faith who heard the call and who gave up everything to follow. Some who traveled long distances not knowing what the land would look like, what the people would be look like, what the culture would be, look, would be like, or what food would taste like. And yet they set out, they heard the call. Charles Wenyon, George Pearson, Roland Rees, and so many others too. We thank you for their courage and faith and their willingness. God, I pray that you might touch each of our hearts today as we too recognize it's our time, it's our generation, it's our opportunity, and it's our calling to serve the present age. And we don't want to shirk that responsibility. We don't want to run away from it. We want to have faith and courage and boldness and the confidence that all those men and women of the past had. We want to see your kingdom come. We want to achieve great things in your name. But we know we can't do any of that until we surrender our all. And so I pray for any of us who are struggling with that surrender. 
Some of us who have never given our lives fully to Christ, never come to the cross and knelt before it, never felt his pardon, his forgiveness, never felt cleansed and renewed, never felt like the new man or woman that you call us and enable us to become. And so I pray, God, that you would bring all of us to that place again today. Total surrender. Bring us to the cross of Jesus that we can kneel before it and offer our all and receive the forgiveness and the love and the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus. That we can rise up from that cross more confident, more bold, more brilliant and fabulous and glorious because we are the sons and daughters of the living God. We're not called to hide our light under a bushel. It's there to shine, to show your love, to reveal the gospel, to lead others to find you and to know you. And we believe our world desperately needs to know the light and love of Jesus. We believe that Hong Kong desperately needs to know the light and love of Jesus. And as Charles and many others went as missionaries to China, we believe that too for China. And so we pray for Hong Kong. We pray for China. God, we pray for our relationship. We pray for the way that you've appointed us to be here, this international church. What is our calling? What is our mission? What is it you need us to be bold and courageous to do? God, you are building this church again. We praise you for that. We praise you for all the new people that have come to join us and the many more who will come. And I pray, God, that as they come here, they might find the anointing of your Holy Spirit. They might find the love of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus. And they might find the power of the Holy Spirit enabling them to serve. So God, in this needy world, use us to be light. Use us to be your voice. Use us to be your hands and your feet that we can share your love and your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So we stand to sing our final hymn. After this, there's a big church lunch on levels five and six. I think we've got over 300, so hopefully some of you will be there. And then to, this afternoon at 3.30, back in here, the Faith Gospel Singers for a concert which will last about an hour. It's a gospel concert, so do come and share with the rest of us here uh, this afternoon as we continue our celebration of this 126th birthday. Let's stand and sing our final hymn. Now thank we all our God.